Committee's third evidence session um, for the inquiry on the Arctic. And we're going to focus today on Russia's strategy in the Arctic and the implications for other Arctic states, uh, including the UK. Now, this is a public session uh, streamed live on the Parliament website and uh, a transcript will be taken and uh, when we finish we will send you a transcript um, so that you can have a look and correct anything that is uh, wrong. Um, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. We've got uh, just under an hour and um, so we're going to aim the question to uh, one of you if, if any of the other um, witnesses feel they want to add something, please do, but don't feel the need to answer every single question. Um, as some of you may or may not come in uh, earlier, perhaps you could just uh, introduce yourselves very briefly uh, and explain who you are and your background. But perhaps you could start with Professor Zisk. Thank you very much. It's it's an honor to to be able to address um, this committee and uh, and share with you my expertise. I am based in Norway, in Oslo, at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies, uh, where I've been professor since 2007. And one of the main focus areas of my work has been, namely, uh, the Arctic and especially security developments and Russian policies uh, in the region. Thank you, Mr. Buleg. Hi, it's an honor to be here as well. I'm, I'm very thankful to be joined by all my colleagues. Uh, I live in New York, but I'm affiliated to Chatham House. I'm a consulting fellow at, uh, at Chatham House, and I'm also a global fellow at the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Charles, who's here? Yes, uh, Nick Childs. I'm the uh, Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security at the uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies. I've been that since 2015. Before that, I was a correspondent and, and journalist for the BBC for more than 30 years, but mainly covering defence and security and, and international affairs at the Institute. I've uh, been doing quite a lot of work on uh, and focus on the Arctic and the High North uh, in recent times, uh, including uh, uh, some very good conversations with my good friends, uh, Katarzyna and, uh, and Mathieu. Good. Thank you very much. So perhaps I could start, um, and I'll direct this first of all to uh, Professor Zisk. Um, we're talking, as I said, about Russia and Russia's view of the Arctic and its, its particular approach. Um, and so I wondered if you could just outline briefly um, what place the Arctic has in Russia's uh, strategic and military thinking. Um, and, and also, uh, we're all interested in the Arctic. Um, is there anything distinctive about the way the Russian uh, military and government policymakers think about the Arctic compared with other Arctic states and near Arctic states such as ourselves? Thank you. Yes, uh, the Arctic plays a central role uh, in Russian military strategic thinking. Notably, it hasn't changed since the actually since the end of the Cold War. But since as, after the turn of the millennium, the focus uh, of the Russian authorities on the Arctic has been increasing. And uh, there are several reasons uh, for why it is the case, which also actually distinguish the way Russia approaches uh, the region compared to other Arctic states. And first, I think the most important is actually the military factors. So the Arctic has remained critical to Russian military doctrine, particularly uh, to strategic deterrence missions. Uh, and Russia, as a result of that, has made significant investments in, in modernizing uh, and deploying new nuclear, uh, strategic non-nuclear and other capabilities and infrastructure uh, in the region over the past 15 years. Uh, which has also resu resulted in a sharp increase in Russian in the number and complexity of Russian military exercises and training in the region. What is important, I think, in this context to note is that Russia has increased its investments uh, also in the central and eastern parts of the Arctic over, especially since 2010. Uh, but the main point of gravity for, milit for the military investments has remained in the high north, so the European part of the Arctic centered around the Northern Fleet, which still remains uh, the most important part of the Russian Navy uh, that holds the largest share of the Russian strategic submarines on the Kola Peninsula, just across the border with Norway. Uh, the Arctic is also important uh, for the Russian air-based nuclear deterrent. There are several uh, forward bases along the Arctic coast. They have actually been used 
for basing and for dispersal of the strategic bombers, as it was well demonstrated after the drone attack on the Russian uh, base, uh, air base in Engels, uh, further south during the, uh, during, uh, the uh, Russian uh, invasion, reinvasion of Ukraine. And so the military strategic importance of the Arctic, in addition to all of that, uh, is further strengthened by uh, the fact that there are crucial elements of, of Russian military infrastructure, there are shipyards, intelligence installations. The Plesetsk uh, Cosmodrome uh, in Arkhangelsk Oblast is used for uh, test launches of ICBMs, uh, military satellites and anti-satellite uh, missiles. Uh, so the region also serves Russia as an important testbed uh, for new weapons and technology, including hypersonic weapons. And it also provides Russia an important access into the Atlantic and, and Pacific Ocean. And this is very important because uh, the Russian naval potential remains separated be between the four uh, main uh, theaters of, of operations. So uh, the Northern Fleet's primary mission uh, remains the bastion defense, so protecting the submarines um, and their operational area through several layers of defenses. But importantly, the region also is important for Russia because uh, it, it uh, of course, it plays a role in nuclear deterrence and strategic balance with the United States, but also the long range uh, precision weapons uh, deployed in the Arctic, they pose a threat to targets in Europe uh, and to the strategic sea lines of communications in the North Atlantic. So uh, in addition to all of that, uh, the opening of the Arctic Ocean to uh, economic exploitation uh, has further increased the value of the Arctic uh, to Russia from the economic point of view, but it also has fueled uh, Russian threat perception. Uh, Russia has been very concerned about the increasing international tension for the Arctic uh, over actually since, since the turn of the millennium. So, and finally, um, the Arctic also holds a symbolically important uh, place in Russia's history and national identity. And so the Russian authorities have leveraged that role uh, over the past few years, uh, in particular, for signaling purposes, both to foreign and domestic audiences. Thank you very much. Um, that was a very uh, good briefing, a good background. Would anyone else like to add anything to that? In which case, um, can we move on to Lord Stirrup? Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Professor. You, you've uh, painted a fairly broad canvas there. Um, I'd just like to explore some of those issues in a bit more detail, in particular um, with regard to Russia's agenda in the region and perhaps its changing agenda. You talked about its uh, strategic priorities. A lot of what you talked about were defensive capabilities, and Russia has always claimed that uh, its, uh, its militarization and, modern, and its modernization of its military in the Arctic has been for defensive purposes. But you did also mention some offensive capabilities uh, in your introduction. So I wonder to what extent uh, Russia's claim uh, to be using uh, its military in the Arctic for purely defensive purposes is credible. Um, and I, I wonder also to what extent its thinking uh, about the importance of the Arctic and its utilization of the Arctic has changed with the, uh, with the invasion of Ukraine uh, and with the accession of Finland and uh, potentially Sweden to NATO uh, and the, uh, the, the expansion of the, the, the NATO-Russia front, as it were, well into the Arctic. Uh, and perhaps in addressing all of that, just to give us a, a sense of perspective, um, you know, we, we, we tend to talk about the Arctic and the militarization of the Arctic and military operations in the Arctic as if they're the same as, uh, as everywhere else. But we have heard in evidence already that um, even with global warming, the, uh, the Arctic is an incredibly difficult place in which to, to operate. Uh, and I wonder how that affects uh, what Russia's uh, doing and what Russia's thinking about in military terms. I mean, perhaps we could start with, uh, with Mr. Buleg and then perhaps, uh, Professor, you can come in afterwards. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to, to address this question. Um, just maybe to, to start with your, your first question in terms of the defensive and offensive approach. I don't believe that distinction is really relevant anymore, to be honest. We used to say that Russia has a defensive posture, but very offensive military capabilities. The issue is that they are using this as a form of control and a form of deterrence against us interchangeably. Um, I would argue Russia is a fundamentally double-dual approach to the Arctic. 
The first is a dual-use approach in terms of the infrastructure. Russia is equally using its military, its infrastructure for a civilian and military purposes interchangeably. They can use it for search and rescue operations and ensure uh, sovereignty enforcement along the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, but also for military purposes. So a double use fundamentally. And the second dual is dual purpose. The use of uh, this rhetoric and the use of these capabilities that can be, by a switch of a button or the flick of a button, be used for defensive or offensive purposes. So in a way, it is both defensive by nature and offensive in intent, with very clear lines when it comes to Russia's strategy. And this is something we can see very clearly in what my colleague Katarzyna mentioned with the bastion defense, for instance. Technically, a defensive, multi-layered network of sensors missile systems, coastal defense systems, electronic warfare capabilities that are supposed to protect or create a protective dome around the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, but in reality could be very well used for standoff purposes, for deterrence purposes in offensive warfare capabilities. I call this a bastionization of the Russian Arctic in the European high north, but also increasingly in the North Pacific with this willingness very clearly in the Russian mind and the Russian doctrine to try to remove tension away from the Arctic as much as possible. As you mentioned, sir, nobody wants to fight in the Arctic because the environment is incredibly complicated and the impact of climate change is very hard to mitigate. Therefore, Russia really wants to increase its defense in depth, remove the tension from the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, extend its military capabilities away from its coastline and its shoreline with clear ambitions of denial, which is putting more pressure on the North Atlantic, especially the sea line of communication, and therefore putting more pressure on the United Kingdom itself with uh, pressure on that very well-known now GI-UK gap, the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, but also the Greenland-Iceland-Norway gap. Uh, Russia clearly wants to interdict freedom of navigation, uh, create contested accesses in regions that are owned by NATO and allies, and in a way try to put more pressure on these regional choke points. The, it is similarly true in the Bering Strait, for instance, uh, on the other side of the world. However, I would not be uh, too sure about Russia's capability to close the gap in as much as their capabilities to extend and project power and be credible in operating beyond their borders that far into NATO territory should be contested. So this is part of deterrence, but I'm sure we will come back to it. And finally, when it comes to uh, Russian objectives in the region, it's very interesting to see that they do not fundamentally understand the Arctic the same way we do. We tend to look at the Arctic from a sort of flank analysis, or we try to divide sectors from what happens in the Pacific, what happens in the West, or what happens in the North Pole. Russia fundamentally sees an inter connected continuum. It is a very long continuum stretching from the North Atlantic to the North Pacific. So what happens in a region has direct consequences in another one, which I argue is a gap in Western analysis on how we approach Russia's Arctic. And similarly, just as much as they have this horizontal approach to the Arctic, they also have a, a sort of vertical approach to the Arctic with the logic of horizontal escalation from one theater of operation to another one. It's a geographic stretch going deep down from the, the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea to the Arctic and now the North Atlantic. So very much a vertical logic in terms of how they see um, escalation in one theater and the consequences it has on another one. What is unique about the Arctic, and I'll finish there, is that Russia feels in a, in a sort of position of strength, contrary to other theaters. They feel that they own the Arctic, symbolically, as my uh, colleague mentioned. Russia considers itself a sort of hyperboreal country, a very large country that has the ability to operate in this region and should not be contested, and therefore wants to impose access on uh, co cost, sorry, on the access uh, to uh, to foreign uh, navies in particular, but also to civilian ships increasingly in the Northern Sea Route. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. This, uh, does Russia's sense of ownership? Um, uh, does Russia feel its sense of ownership of the Arctic is threatened by NATO's expansion into the Arctic with Finland and potentially Sweden? Um, definitely. I, I think there is, um, it increases Russia's sense uh, of, of vulnerability. I think in general, uh, the 
consequences, uh, many unintended consequences of, of the Russian uh, assault uh, on Ukraine has profoundly reshaped Arctic security, um, uh, cooperation and governance regimes also for Russia. Uh, it has heightened the role of the Arctic uh, as an arena for uh, also for confrontation between Russia and the West, again, stimulating the Russian threat perception. Um, it has also been influenced by the ripple effects uh, of the ongoing strategic competition between the United States, China and, and Russia. So um, as a result of that, the Russian military strategic approach to the Arctic has evolved in several ways. And notably, despite Russia being bogged down in, in Ukraine, suffering a host of negative uh, military, socioeconomic, political consequences, Moscow has actually not deprioritized the Arctic as many has expected. Uh, quite the contrary, uh, the political will to prioritize the Arctic seems to stand strong in Moscow uh, and has been corroborated in a number of ways at the doctrinal and policy implementation level, including in the maritime updated maritime doctrine in July last year, which has moved uh, the Arctic to the top uh, of the list of regional priorities. Uh, the region is also referred to as vital now by the Russian um, in the Russian documents, vital to Russia's national interests. Um, and uh, the, the Russian continued focus on the region has been also reflected in an, a quite, uh, quite intense military activity taking place in the region. So, uh, as you know, the, the, the results uh, of, of the weakening of the Russian conventional forces is a, a stronger focus on nuclear weapons, which makes, again, the high north uh, more important to Russia. And the expectation is that uh, as Russia will take, it will probably take years for Russia to rebuild parts of the conventional force that has been decimated in Ukraine. Again, the, the nuclear weapons will stand very strong. They're at the core of the Russian military doctrine. Uh, so uh, Russia has used uh, the, uh, both the region um, and the forces from, from the Arctic in, in the assault on Ukraine. The strategic bombers that are stationed in the high north have been engaged in, in the aerial assaults uh, on Ukraine. And since February last year, the personnel from the, from the Russian Arctic 200 a separate motor rifle brigade from the 8th Arctic Motor Rifle Brigade and other units, they have lost hundreds of personnel uh, and material on the background, uh, on the battleground in, in Ukraine. Um, and notably, uh, other parts of the of the northern fleet they have remained largely unaffected by the war, which means that the strategic deterrence forces are able to conduct their core missions uh, that I have mentioned earlier, uh, so both at the local, at the regional, and the global level. Uh, and and with the accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO, the importance of the Arctic to Russia is likely again to increase, strengthening the Russian sense of vulnerability. Uh, there is a reassessment in Russia going on regarding deployments, regarding weapons and organizational structures uh, in the region. So um, with the weakening of the Russian conventional forces, I think also, and uh, Matthew has mentioned that, uh, the non-military and dual use uh, capabilities in the Arctic will play a larger role. And this is also confirmed by the Russian authorities. Uh, this, is, uh, this concerns the capabilities that belong to uh, the main a director for deep sea research, which is able to disrupt or degrade uh, critical subsea infrastructure and other marine infrastructure. And the Russian authorities have also highlighted the importance to increase civilian military cooperation. And this also includes using Russian civilian ships and vessels for, for military operations. And lastly, um, the Arctic uh, has been um, a currency in the hands of Putin in his relations with Russia. With, sorry, with China. Uh, China, as you know, um, has been um, interested uh, in, in strengthening its position in the Arctic, and, and Russia, as, as Russia is looking for Chinese support, uh, they are growing more dependent on Beijing, and we've seen already some ripple effects, uh, spillover effects of that in the Arctic. And one recent example is the memorandum that has been uh, signed uh, a few days ago in Murmansk uh, between the Chinese and Russian Coast Guard. And this is interesting and important because it opens up for an extensive cooperation in Arctic waters, including joint efforts on fighting terrorism, illegal migration, smuggling, illegal fishing. 
So it means that this kind of cooperation, we'll see how it will develop, what kind of content it will have, but it certainly has a potential to include the security dimension in this cooperation, which is a new quality in Russia's approach uh, to, to China in the Arctic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask you, um, we've got quite a few questions we need to get through, so if you can um, be as concise as you can. Um, uh, Lord Robertson. Yeah, the... the in many ways, uh, you have answered a number of questions <laughs> in that last answer that we might that we might have asked, uh, and, and certainly I would uh, be interested in, and especially mm. the dimension to do with uh, with bringing China in the the Eurasian aspects of the of the Arctic. But I wanted to focus at the moment on the um, basically the Russian military capability, which you have also uh, addressed. Uh, there have been some indications from intelligence that um, Arctic forces have been seen in the Donbass. So, so there has been a degrading, or has there, can I, can I ask you, has there been a degrading of the Russian land forces and the Arctic uh, Brigade uh, because of the deployment of forces to, uh, to Ukraine? The second aspect is whether or not you see the effectiveness of the Russian armed forces in the Arctic uh, as being as bad as they clearly were in <clears> the initial <throat> assault on Ukraine. Clearly, the high command were taken very much by surprise by the uh, ineffectiveness of the, of the Russian armed forces in that initial invasion. And I just wonder whether there has now been an, a reassessment of, uh, of the forces, all the forces in the Arctic as a consequence of that re-evaluation. Thank you. Uh, so yes, the first question, I definitely, the Russian ground forces has been severely weakened in the Arctic. Um, and from, I mentioned these two brigades, uh, we know that there are probably more than 1,000 people that has been lost, the number is uncertain. Uh, so that and that will take years. Uh, so and this this influences especially the the uh, protection uh, and the defensive roles uh, of of the Russian uh, military in the Arctic. However, as I mentioned, it, the, the air force and sea force has been largely unaffected uh, by the war in Ukraine, which again means that especially when it comes to threatening NATO European targets but also the nuclear deterrence in relation to the United States, this, these roles are not affected by, by the war. So this, is, this still remains a, a for it to, uh, to be reckoned with. Now, when it comes to ineffectiveness of, of the Russian uh, military we have seen in Ukraine, I, I think there is definitely a, a large number of weaknesses and problems that have been clearly uh, exposed, which, uh, for instance, concerns yeah. the, uh, the Russian command and control, uh, the, the inflexibility, uh, the slow learning process. Uh, however, I think uh, you know, drawing conclusions from what happened in Ukraine, we have to remember it has been an active process. It was not the question of whether Russian forces are strong or weak, but also how they have been used. And we know very well that the force that was prepared was not really uh, uh, prepared. There were no plans to use it in the way the actual was used. I think this also influences uh, uh, the effect uh, and as certainly exacerbates weaknesses and problems in the Russian military. I think that Russia would not underestimate a potential confrontation with NATO, and certainly the Northern Fleet and the forces deployed in the Arctic are aimed for this kind of roles. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Um, yes. Just oh, briefly, would you like to? Yes, just briefly, if I can pick up on uh, Katarzyna's points, um, and uh, Lord Robertson, uh, in terms of uh, uh, an assessment of uh, capabilities in the north uh, and read across from what, what we've seen in, in Ukraine, as Katarzyna uh, mentioned, um, uh, certainly uh, the, uh, the thinning out of the, uh, the, the land forces in, in the north and the, and, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, damage that, that those forces that it, it seems have been deployed uh, into the Ukraine conflict have, have faced um, has uh, you know, raised questions about the, uh, the capabilities on land as far as uh, the north is concerned. And when you add to that, uh, from the point earlier made about the, you know, the inclusion now um, of Finland and, 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 and presumably also Sweden into the mix of, of, of NATO countries, the, the, the correlation of forces, if you like, uh, in that area uh, for, 
from a, from a Russian perspective, uh, uh, ha has changed. However, um, that uh, that doesn't necessarily affect, and, and, and it's actually probably um, a, rather, a rather different perspective in terms of uh, certain of the capabilities in, 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 in land-based missile capabilities, both in defensive and offensive capabilities, but precisely as, as was mentioned as far as the, uh, the, the naval forces and particularly submarine forces are concerned. Uh, the, these have not been directly affected, they've not been directly involved, there has always been an assumption which uh, I think think still holds up to a point that these uh, have been the crown jewel capabilities to, to some extent, that they have uh, been uh, maintained and are operated at a higher level than, than some of the other general um, land forces in particular. Um, that hasn't been tested, uh, but I think is, is, it, it's still uh, reasonable to assume that that is the case. Perhaps more important than that, that these naval forces, the submarine forces that operate in the Arctic, as, 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 as Mathieu has suggested, are also at the vanguard of being able to threaten NATO out of the Arctic into the North Atlantic. Um, I think that the, the importance of those forces relatively will increase if you have, whatever the outcomes in Ukraine, a, 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 a damaged and resentful um, uh, uh, Russia that is trying to rebuild its land forces, uh, the, the, the naval forces in terms of being able to maintain that uh, at least perception uh, of great power mm -hmm. capability that can coerce or influence NATO, the, the naval forces based around the Kola Peninsula in the northern fleet uh, become you know, a significantly uh, uh, greater lever in that. The question going forward is how that would may be affected in terms of, of resources going forward. Uh, it, it, it's been a case that, uh, although ca capable, the submarine forces in particular are small in number. The, the Russian uh, shipbuilding industry, inefficient as it is, has struggled to uh, deliver on time and, and, and uh, in numbers required. Um, uh, where the balance of investment will be going forward in terms of rebuilding land forces if required and air force Forces, or putting more resources into sustaining these crown jewels going forward, I think is, is, is an important question. And given the role of the, the Arctic and, and the increased importance of the Arctic from a Moscow point of view, I would say that will become a, 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 a more significant area of um, investment going forward in order to sustain these key capabilities. Thank you very much. Um, so Lady Morris. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much to all three of you for joining us from, the, from near and far. It's been fascinating so far. Uh, Mr. Buleg, I'm going to uh, direct my question at you, if that's okay. Um, Russia has conducted numerous operations in the Arctic that could be regarded as provocative or threatening to other countries in the past, and yet you said in your earlier remarks uh, that Russia looks as if it wants to remove the tension from the Arctic uh, regions. So my, my first question, which is in two parts, is in your view, um, could a conflict between Russia and the West be initiated in the Arctic? And, and secondly, you also mentioned um, that escalation in one region could easily uh, spill over in, in, into another. And in this uh, respect, how high do you think the risk is that a conflict between uh, Russia and the West in another region could spill over into the Arctic. Thank you very much for your for your questions. So, to start with, as my colleagues mentioned, Russia's false posture has been vastly vindicated by the war, and therefore, sort of um, validating the, the the logic in the Kremlin that uh, NATO's borders are expanding, that uh, NATO is out there to get closer to us, and so on. All that part of Russian propaganda. Um, and if you look at a map, it is true that the non-Russian Arctic is now technically NATO territory or a form of NATO 7. The non-Russian Arctic is the NATO 7 uh, instead of the Arctic 7. So it is therefore putting more pressure on Russia to respond and to replace that sense of strength that I mentioned by a sense of vulnerability that Kartuzina uh, alluded to. Um, so therefore, it is a fait accompli that we need to live with, this fear of encirclement by uh, the Kremlin which is indeed forcing uh, the Russia to respond through provocative action and through a form of tit-for-tat action-reaction dynamic increasingly shaping Arctic security. 
However, I don't believe that uh, conflict in the Arctic could happen per se. There is very little likelihood of a conflict arising from the region itself. I'm not saying things could not degenerate into the Arctic, but the risk of a confrontation or a conflagration between NATO, Western forces and Russia in and within the Arctic uh, to this day remains fairly low. Um, the threat through the north, passing through the north, is greater than the threat to the north itself today. Just as much as Russia's presence, remilitarization and build-up in the Arctic is about the Russian Arctic rather than for the Russian Arctic. Once again, it is about putting more pressure on the North Atlantic and the North Pacific increasingly. Um, there are, however, many risks associated to this horse posture, and especially in the context of Russia willing to take more risks and willing to be more accepting of these risks. The first one is definitely the worst, the, the risk and the worst of escalation, horizontal escalation that I mentioned, the spillover uh, effect that could uh, degenerate from one region to the other, specifically in a sort of Baltic Nordic environment and this continuum between what happens in the Baltic Sea in the context of Sweden and Finland joining NATO mm -hmm. and in the high north, potentially degenerating into the North Atlantic. Um, also, not least, because there is a lack of transparency and increased secrecy around Russian activities in the Arctic. If we look at the track record of Russian incidents in the past few years, whether it is the Norilsk spill or the Ninoxa radiation incidents that was picked up by the Norwegian Radiological Agency, there is more secrecy around uh, activities that could lead to further escalation if we don't know what's going on. So this is putting more pressure on us in the collective West to have better domain awareness and intelligence gathering around Russian activities there. And this risk of escalation is compounded by what I call miscalculation and tactical errors. Basically, the very simple equation that a changing Arctic means more people, more human presence, military and civilian, and more presence mean, means more incidents, basically. More accidents, more incidents at sea and in the air. And if we look at Russia's uh, reaction or reception of, uh, of different events, for instance, in Syria with the spats with Turkey in 2015, or the intercept, the recent intercept in the Black Sea that was already mentioned, then I would not take Russian restraint for granted anymore when it comes to managing the Arctic uh, in a sort of low tension environment. It would not benefit Russia to escalate in case of accident in the region, once again because they want to move tension away, but accidents happen. And there is always the, the, the possibility and the opportunity for accidents to happen. Hot-headed pilots that have been decimated in Ukraine to have very strong and uh, very brazen reaction and therefore leads to brinkmanship, brinkmanship sorry, activities that could increase the cost of deterrence and therefore leads to escalation and if not confrontation. So there is definitely less restraint and more pressure in this environment. And finally, another risk is linked to sub-threshold activities, what we commonly call hybrid activities, or below the, the threshold of Article 5 activities uh, in sort of multi-domain operations. And this is a significance these days when it comes to deep sea infrastructure or sub-sea infrastructure, with the risk of Russia increasingly putting pressure on critical national infrastructure sub-sea, from cables, for instance, um, for for uh, network ca uh, cables and data cables for pipelines as well. And we have a track record now around Svalbard, with Nord Stream 2 incidents, recent drone overflights over energy facilities in Norway, damages done to cables in the Faroe or Shetland Islands and so on. So there is definitely more pressure in this area, whether it is the Baltic Sea, the High North, and increasingly around the GI-UK gap. Uh, and Russia is willing to take uh, more risk and accept more cost. So subsea warfare is increasingly becoming a thing that we should be we should be all aware of. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. Is there anything briefly um, either Professor Zisk or Ms. Charles want to add? In, um, in, in particular respect to this, um, uh, just to reinforce uh, Mathieu's point about um, uh, the, uh, the, the interconnectedness of, uh, of the regions, and, and, and if not uh, a direct threat in, in, in the Arctic, then in and around the Arctic and the needs particularly with the, uh, with, with the changes in NATO, um, to see uh, you know, the Baltic and, and, and the Arctic interrelated. And um, uh, in terms of 
potential uh, hotspots to, um, to 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 look out for in yeah. in and around this region that that will um, will will um, potentially cause. Uh, uh, Frictions, uh, Matthew mentioned Svalbard, and I think uh, as a lever point, uh, given the given the while it has Norwegian uh, sovereignty, uh, there is a, a Russian population there that uh, Moscow is is very, uh, very, very has been very adept in the past in using as as a lever for 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 a pressure point. I think that is that is an important <coughs> aspect. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Lord Soames, and Thank I think you. Lady Cousins got a supplementary, so you're going to get two questions. Now. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Charles, um, with, what's your assessment of, um, with, with Russia's newly f cozying up <coughs> to China and vice versa, what assessment would you make of, of the impact that that may have on the Arctic, given that the Chinese have already been seen to be very interested in and consider themselves to be a near-Arctic state? And, and, and how do you think that will play out in the near future? Um, I think that is that, that is absolutely an important uh, nexus, and uh, uh, Mo Moscow, I think, will become increasingly reliant on 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 China pot potentially uh, to help prop up and 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 support uh, the investments required in order to uh, sustain the arctic as that um, uh, fount for you know potential future um, future uh, you know e e economic uh, stability as far as russia is concerned uh, in the context of in the context particularly of uh, enduring uh, Western s sanctions, and I think that's probably also the case for for a number uh, uh, of other, you know, potential Western partners. Uh, in that, um, uh, India is is another one. So I think that will have an effect. I think it will also have have an effect in terms of the. Uh, the, the, the governance, you know, the potential issues around governance, and this has a has an has a has has an effect on uh, how you know NATO may or may not proceed mm. in terms of trying to uh, balance that uh, um, uh, requirement between a sustaining and improving deterrence, um, not provoking, but also trying to uh, ensure you know, stability in the Arctic, and that is um, whatever happens as far as the governance of the Arctic going forward and one of the one of the victims uh, um, uh, in in the uh, um, one of the casualties in the uh, uh, fallout from from Ukraine as far as the Arctic is concerned has been the uh, essentially um, putting 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 into deep freeze uh, the Arctic Council in in, in, in many respects and um, the uh, interests of China in particular uh, in, in, in conjunction uh, with, with Russia of having a greater role in the Arctic and potentially uh, setting up sort of a, a, a rival sphere of influence uh, as far as Arctic governance is concerned is, I think, a, an issue to be concerning about. Uh, further, further down the line, there is, a, there, there, is a, there is a question mark over how far that goes in terms of a Russia-China relationship. And uh, um, uh, Mathieu has coined a phrase, I think, apropos Russia's attitude to, to NATO in the Arctic, of, of too much NATO in the Arctic as far as Russia is concerned. I think there is an issue around whether potentially uh, uh, there, there could be too much China in in the Arctic as far as uh, Russia is concerned. So, so the extent to which uh, the uh, shared interests will uh, uh, cement the Russia-China axis going forward, or potentially provide friction, uh, ultimately, I think is is an open question. The other question is uh, in those calculations and in terms of whether there is a bill to pay in Moscow for for. Uh, Chinese support for Russia generally, as far as Ukraine is concerned, is whether that would involve at some point um, a renewed request, and it's been reported requests have been made in the past, for China to have port access and, and greater naval access from Russian bases in the Arctic as a way of further increasing its presence in the long term and potentially its role and influence as a naval and military power in the Arctic as well. Um, Lady Cousins, you're on clear supplementary. Um, thank you. I just wanted to stretch this global perspective a little bit further still, because we heard from another witness um, in a previous session that we shouldn't ignore the increasing interest in the Arctic region by 
certain Middle Eastern countries, notably Saudi <coughs> Arabia and the UAE. And so I wondered if you could comment on that, perhaps what the particular objectives of that increasing interest are and what the potential implications are for the Arctic states and near-Arctic states themselves. I think it, it, it would be wrong to, 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 to kind of underestimate the, the, um, the extent to which there, there is global interest in, in, in uh, what, what is unfolding in the Arctic. And as far as you know, Middle Eastern countries are concerned in the context of their, you know, their strategic position as you know, the world readjusts in terms of, of, of energy requirements, readjusts in terms of uh, you know, how, the, how trade flows will, um, will evolve um, if the, the Northern Sea Route and, and, and other routes in the Arctic become uh, more navigable, <coughs> navigable uh, uh, apropos um, uh, 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 Asian and Euro-Atlantic uh, trade, trade, trade links, uh, where, that would, where that would lead um, the Gulf and the Middle East in, in, in terms of the long-term uh, strategic position it, it has at the moment. It, in, in a way, uh, the, the, the Gulf <laughs> Has, has, has pivoted in terms of where its interests lie uh, to, towards Asia, China, Japan, um, South Korea as, as importers of, of, of energy. Where that will go in the longer term, I think, is, is, is a question. So, so everyone is, 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 is watching the um, uh, uh, dynamics of the Arctic uh, and, and its potential uh, role in, in it. So Saudi Arabia is one, Turkey is another that's expressing an interest as, as well. And I think that goes back to the, to the point about the need to be uh, careful about how to, how to calculate uh, between uh, raising tensions and, and maintaining stability and returning to a sustainable and acceptable level of government, governance uh, in, the, uh, in, in the region, in the Arctic in particular, um, as a result of the, 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 greater, global, the greater global interest, the, 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 the more varied constituency with which countries like Russia uh, and China uh, can appeal in, in terms of how governance and, and, and the, uh, 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 you know, maintaining stability in the region uh, is, is going in the future. So I think, um, <clears throat> if you wouldn't mind being brief, but I think Mr. Bouleg would like to add something. Yeah, just very quickly, thank you very much. I would, I would push that logic even further because Russia, China has demonstrated a willingness to change the norms and the governance facts in the Arctic. They want a free-for-all global common. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that if you, if you leave that logic go along and if you don't protect uh, Arctic institutions and, and this, this sense of um, national interest in the Arctic, then you could very well imagine a future, a not so distant future, where China tries to coalesce <clears throat> a certain number of, of states proclaiming to be in the Arctic, even though that term is very contested, and try to push for, better, for different norms, not necessarily better norms, <clears throat> but norms that would fit the Chinese agenda. Imagine all the shipping nations of Asia, some shipping nations in um, the, uh, the Gulf, for instance, or in, uh, in other parts of the world, pushing in the same direction with China at the forefront. That would completely and drastically change the way we approach the Arctic. Um, it might be a far-fetched scenario, but if we can think about it, then there's probably a plan for it somewhere in Beijing. Thank you very much. Um, and Lord Anson, yes. what, what significance do you attach to the recent summit or between China and Russia at Murmansk, supposedly on maritime law enforcement? Thank you, sir. I don't know if that question is directed to me, but I can take the first jab and let my, my colleagues uh, respond. Um, I think there's a lot of posturing in as much as Russia and China relations are very much about the formats and less so about the substance. So I would love to see what I would love. <laughs> Let's judge it by the substance and see how deep this collaboration goes. So far, they are testing the waters, so to speak, in terms of soft security, constabulary forces, search and rescue, better communication and collaboration is sort of soft security element. If this is pushed further in terms of hard security or military exercises or drills or a more military intent, 
in the region, then yes, we will have cause for concern. But so far, I think it's part of this package of relationship between Russia and China, where they are really trying to increase their footprint together and show that they can do better together than apart. So I would not be too concerned so far, but I would still definitely keep tabs on activities, especially if they they verge on the harder security element. I'd like to move on, if we may, because we've got quite a lot um, to deal with. And and if we move on to how we respond to Russia, um, Lady Saug. Thank you. And this is for Professor Zisk. Um, we spoke earlier about the, the risk, the relatively low risk of conflict being actually initiated in the Arctic, but also about the incidents that may happen. And given the, the current state of Russia-NATO relations, obviously there's the increased risk of miscalculation and misunderstanding around those incidents. So do you think that other Arctic states can and should still try to seek some cooperation with Russia um, and try to start, try to have deconfliction activities to help reduce that risk. Thank you. So yes, uh, since the early days of the invasion, these questions have been raised um, in the policy and academic circles about the possibility of opening for some limited pragmatic cooperation with Russia in the Arctic. <clears throat> for instance, at a lower level of working groups uh, within the Arctic Council. I think that for now, the cooperation with Russia remains remote, especially, I think, uh, since the discovery of the ever multiplying Russian war crimes uh, and atrocities committed uh, by the Russian armed forces in Ukraine. I think this kind of cooperation also poses a risk of offering Moscow an opportunity to set a foot in the door, which have they, they have been seeking, mm-hmm and slowly uh, get back to business as usual uh, that Russia is hoping for. Uh, And I think such a cooperation could also provide Russia an international legitimacy. Uh, There is a risk also that that Russia could instrumentalize and exploit it for political purposes. Uh, That said, uh, given the growing tensions, uh, the high and an increasing level of military activity also by uh, from NATO countries, I think it is critical uh, to maintain uh, communication channels. It is a, a very important instrument to, to prevent, uh, to, to reduce risk of conflict and increase also accountability for possible uh, dangerous uh, military practices yeah. and situations. And I think a very good example of that is the hotline that is maintained between the chief of the Norwegian Joint Headquarters in Reitan in the high north and uh, the commander uh, in chief of the, of the northern fleet on the Russian side. Uh, so this is the kind of very important deconfliction mechanism. I think also that practical cooperation on uh, sav- saving lives, uh, such as search and rescue, is, is another example of, of cooperation that should be maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good. I think we can move on. Um, Lord Anson. NATO already has close links with Finland and Sweden through Partnership for Peace and operations, but obviously the accession in time of both Finland and Sweden will increase NATO's interest in the area. Can you chart that evolution through um, summit communiques and so on? And um, what do you think would be the effect of that accession um, already of Finland and soon of Sweden? Would you expect it to figure, for example, at the coming Vilnius summit? And what are the risks of increased NATO interest in the region? Mr. Buleg, perhaps you could take that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so, in, indeed, the consequences of the war, once again, is this vindication uh, of an, a sort of all, all Arctic uh, NATO for Russia. Uh, and there has been renewed uh, interest or a sort of a new coming interest from the alliance uh, to Arctic operation, not just the North Atlantic, but really the, 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 high, the Arctic and the High North. Uh, with with the creation of Joint Forces Command Norfolk, for instance, a few years ago, expansion of the alliance now, which is strengthening the uh, the Baltic and Nordic flanks, but also increased American interest with the recent uh, White House strategy on the Arctic, which is coalescing all the uh, all the efforts um, in in the United States. Um, the issue with NATO is that the moment you place it in any form of environment, uh, it vindicates Russia's posture and Russia's willingness to engage because. NATO is coming. Uh, Therefore, uh, since it is a military machine, we should be careful about how much NATO and what is the distinct role and place uh, 
that NATO should have in a region that we want, ideally, between the Arctic 7 and with Russia, to keep uh, as low tension as possible uh, away from geopolitical competition, even though that world might be over. So the, the question of how much NATO is necessary in the Arctic should be paused. Um, we f must find innovative ways to be involved in regional military security at the level of the alliance without monopolizing the debate, without completely crystallizing everything around military security and around uh, military affairs. Um, then it's a question of defining the role and place of NATO. More than the what NATO should do, it really is about uh, its role and its place. I am not sure NATO needs a full-fledged or a proper Arctic strategy, but definitely needs a form of framework of response for operating, sustaining and deploying force uh, in, in the environment. Then there comes a the question of the command structure, which is still very unclear. It's a question that is uh, now asked, for instance, in the United States. Should it be between NORTHCOM or UCOM, North Command or European Command? Basically, should operations sit in Norfolk or in Brunson? Just as much as we don't really have a lot of clarity in the interaction between Joint Force Command Norfolk and U.S. structures as they uh, as they move along uh, in this environment. Just as much as we don't really have a very clear distinction of the uh, division of labor between NATO itself and NORAD and the North Warning System, on the other hand. So a more streamlined division of labor is now necessary. All these questions are here and they're on paper, so there's a lot of people working on them to make sure that there is no um, sort of uh, replication of efforts and there is there is good redundancy but no duplication of effort in the region um, the internal risk that it poses is militarizing or securitizing the debate around the Arctic uh, just uh, as much as we don't discuss with Russia about these things and military uh, security cooperation is next to impossible uh, NATO is moving closer to the Arctic then there is a risk of uh, military security affairs overtaking the debate so that we don't really discuss what really matters in the Arctic, which is the impact of climate change, which is the protection of indigenous and local communities in the Arctic. Uh, and so, so it is crucial to have a forum to discuss military security issues, but that is not NATO. Otherwise, it might drive the discussion and lead to a form of overt securitization of the debate, um, which would collapse this reality of a sort of low tension um, that, that, that we need. So beyond low tension, and this will be my, my final word, I think we need more predictability and more stability uh, to make sure that we minimize misunderstandings with the Kremlin without fully engaging with the Kremlin or offering olive branches to Russia, uh, as it were. Thank you very much. We've, we've only got about nine minutes, so um, Lord Boateng. Mr. Ch Charles, can we now turn to the contribution that the UK might play in defence and deterrence in the Arctic? How can uh, we best support uh, our Arctic uh, state allies? What capabilities uh, do we, the U as, the, as the UK, the US, through NATO, what capabilities do we have in this area? How can we project forces into the European Arctic in the event uh, of conflict, and what additional capabilities, if any, uh, do we need to invest in, in your view? Thank you. Um, um, to pick up from Matthew's line of thought on, on NATO, but focusing on, on, on UK and, 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 and others um, in, in, in the alliance, um, I, th I think uh, delivering a, a, a more consistent but also transparent message in terms of presence into the into the Arctic uh, to support uh, support allies is uh, is is an Im important one um, because although um, uh, there is a, a sense as, as was said early very early on that nobody really wants to operate in the Arctic in terms of, of actual uh, uh, you know, credible deterrence, um, um, sh showing an ability actually to to relearn the lessons that have been forgotten since the Cold War um, of of actually operating in, in the region is 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 important, uh, and that could potentially include um, certain capabilities that. Um, uh, the Arctic partners uh, within the alliance uh, don't have at the high, in terms of high-end capabilities, um, uh, in terms of, for example, our literal manoeuvre capability that, 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 that is being developed but, but probably needs greater investment, uh, the littoral response group that's already 
practiced up in up in that region. Um, but in order not to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, overheat the, the situation uh, and not 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 to to escalate and provoke rather than to to add, uh, um, just to add add presence, uh, I think it needs to be a mixture uh, of capabilities. So presence may be delivered um, uh, with with lower end. Uh, uh, capabilities in, in order to, to sustain those interests that, that, that we say we uh, support, uh, like freedom of, of navigation. And it's interesting, for example, that um, you know, the United States is uh, in reinvesting after a long gap in, in icebreaker capabilities, question mark over what actual military value that has, but in terms of enabling a capability uh, into, it, 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 that can operate effectively in the region, that would be, that would be one. Uh, Canada is doing the same. Um, whether the UK uh, should, should also um, uh, look seriously at raising its sort of Arctic and ice capable um, um, uh, forces, uh, I, I think is an open question. Uh, it may be that uh, the UK missed a trick when, uh, when the uh, British Antarctic Survey ordered uh, the Sir David Attenborough ship, not ordering three, so the Royal Navy could have you know, two um, sort of uh, Antarctic and an Arctic patrol, patrol vessel that, that, that would be able to signal uh, intent and capability in the region, but not, not in a provocative way. Um, the other area, picking up on, on um, uh, what uh, Mathieu was saying uh, about the growing importance and growing concern highlighted by Nord Stream of critical uh, seabed infrastructure and, and seabed warf warfare in that region, then uh, further investments in capabilities like the, um, the uh, uh, multi-role ocean support ships. Uh, it's, it, I think Nord Stream has shown clearly that there is a huge deficit in terms of the West in terms of being able to deliver that, and, and what the UK has done is a start, but only a start. Mm. So that's the sort of area that, 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 that could be further developed, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, Lord Ford. Um, yes, thank you. Maybe this is to Mathieu first, but um, the question, I wanted to ask a question about the Northern Sea Route and how provocative or wise it would be for the UK and other partners and NATO partners to conduct freedom of navigation exercise in these waters, particularly given the law that Russia passed at the end of last year about the 90 day, re requiring 90 day notification. Um, is there any value in these exercises and, and is the degree of provocation now significantly greater than it otherwise would have been? Could I ask you, you to be I'll very brief because yeah. I think Professor Zish would like to uh, add something as well. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Oh, Gazarzino, please go ahead. Uh, I, might, I might jump in. And, yeah. All right, thank you. So I think whether this kind of operation should be conducted in, in this current uh, situation depends on the level of, of appetite for risk. I do believe that uh, the high tensions between Russia and the West, um, Russia's increasing sense of vulnerability, which I've mentioned earlier, um, deriving from, from the growing military, economic and political weakness, uh, they all, uh, I think there is a possibility that Russia has grown more sensitive uh, to this kind of operation, the FONOPS along the Northern Sea Road. And as you mentioned, so the Russian authorities uh, have expressed an increasing concern about foreign military presence in the Arctic. I mean, they've done it for years, but now it seems there is something more concrete to this. And, and it has been reflected in strategic documents, including in the Maritime Doctrine, but also in the new law that you have just mentioned, was signed in December. And on the one hand, it, this law was in a way necessary because it was drafted, um, uh, so the existing rules for, for, um, for regulating navigations along the Northern Sea Route uh, based on the Article 234 of the UNCLOS, uh, they did not apply to foreign warships or other non-governmental, um, non-commercial government vessels. So this was in a way a necessity, but as you said, there are these new rules. There is the application that has to be actually um, uh, up the, the vessel has to apply for permission 90 days before the passage and the application can be declined for security reasons. Uh, a new rule is also, uh, which is, which is uh, quite interesting, is that it, the law puts a limit of no more than one warship allowed to be in these uh, waters at a time. Submarines are required to surface and, and show their flag while passing uh, through the Northern Sea Road internal waters. And um, 
So as we know, the, the new law, it applies to internal waters along the Northern Sea Route, which, you know, it, in general, it's a quite small portion of, of the maritime channel. But of course, importantly, it applies to these four disputed straits, which the United States and other nation, nations uh, consider international straits and therefore subject to innocent passage. So I think Arctic FANOPs uh, carry inherent risks. They will now go against the law, should, should the law be ignored, and, and could be seen as a provocation, which I think there is a chance that Russia would uh, take a more assertive uh, stance uh, in the region. However, I think if, if the FANOPs were to take place, they have to be carefully planned and well coordinated with other partners and allies in the region, and I think skillfully communicated as well to calibrate the risks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Charles, you wanted to be very brief. Uh, very briefly. I uh, absolutely agree with Katarzyna. The one, the one addition I would make is that there is also a risk in not doing it. There is a risk in uh, uh, not uh, maintaining that presence and, and not carrying out that, that, uh, that, those actions because then it becomes customary fait accompli in, 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 in international terms. How you do it, as I say, whether it has yes. to be the most provocative um, uh, capabilities or something a little bit more benign but at least to show it is, is part of the calculation. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our session. We could have gone on for another hour at least. Um, we're particularly interested in, in the answers that you would have given to uh, questions 11 and 12, which are key recommendations, and have we set the right priorities? And if, if it's not too much to ask, um, I, I wondered if you might be able to uh, write in a, an email with your answers to those questions, because they're, they're particularly interesting to us, and we could have discussed them for a long time. But um, just wanted to say thank you very much, all of you, in your different time zones um, uh, for coming. Um, and um, uh, I just remind you that a transcript will be sent to you and you can um, have a look at that and make any corrections that you want. But we're very grateful to your uh, letting us have your knowledge and uh, mm -hmm. for making the effort to come. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, so, yeah. thank you very much. And um, so I declare the um, public session is, is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. 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 <laughs>
The proceeding has ended. 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 